Let me introduce Joel to you. Joel is a friend. I've, I've known Joel, uh, I, I think, for um, 13 years now. I met Joel many years ago. We were both younger, and um, I was fitter, and he's the same. Um, <laughs> but he is, he is a dear friend. I have observed his godliness going through intense trial and suffering. And now he has been a pastor for many years at Covenant Fellowship Church. And both Aaron and I love any time we can spend with Joel. He is just one of those men that makes you believe that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And he exhibits that every time you see him. Obviously, his example in memorizing God's word is profoundly inspiring. And we have fresh reason to pray for him in the future because Joel is going to be planting a church. It will be in 2018, so it is coming up. It is in Newark. I'm trying to say that correctly, Newark. Uh, not Newark. I was told it's not Newark. It's Newark. Uh, but he's going to be planting a church, going with a team of people from Covenant Fellowship, and uh, very excited. Aaron and I both very excited to see this man preaching God's word on a weekly basis, raising up a church. But I wanted to add a more personal voice, an even better voice than mine, certainly. Uh, Jared Mellinger is the senior pastor of Covenant Fellowship Church, and I asked him how he would describe Joel. And Jared said this about his friend and fellow pastor. Joel is without any exaggeration, one of the best and most broadly gifted pastors I know. He is a skilled counselor, a diligent student, a passionate preacher, and a wise elder. He loves people with uniquely strong relational gifting, and he loves God's word with a uniquely strong commitment to scripture memory. He is an example as a husband and a father, and he is a great friend to me. When he first expressed his desire for church planting to the elders, there was a unanimous affirmation that he is gifted to lead a church. And the sacrifice and faith he has shown in desiring to plant are consistent with the man of faith God has made him to be. Sweet words from a close friend and senior pastor who knows you well. Joel, thank you for serving us. Thank you for leading. And we want you to know before you preach how excited we are to be partnering with you in planting the church you're going to plant. It is our privilege to invest in church plants under men like you. So if we can welcome Joel as he comes up and preach God's word to us. Good morning again. It is good to be with you. We have had a fantastic week with members of your church serving your children. I knew coming in that I loved Redemption Hill because I knew the pastors of Redemption Hill, two of the most faithful and two of the best encouragers I know. These pastors uh, have pastored me many times, and so I know that you're in good hands. And then I come and I encounter so many of you, and I see that they're just leading people of the same style and same, same godliness. Redemption Hill Covenant Fellowship from the distant land of Pennsylvania sends their greeting and their love to all of you. We thank God for you and for the work that he is, is doing here. We love being in partnership, as John just said, of us. Um, it's a joy to be in sovereign grace together. We are not exactly happy or pleased or content with the fact that you stole Stan and Judy Boulay from us. But we are getting over it slowly and trusting God that it's for his glory. We love you from PA. If you have your Bibles, please turn in them to James chapter 1 with me. James chapter 1. I, I love the book of James. It was just over 12 years ago that I was diagnosed with a severe and aggressive cancer as a 21-year-old man. It was two weeks before my wedding day on Christmas Eve when I received the diagnosis. And as you can imagine, a diagnosis like that changes your life, changes the direction of your life in a pretty significant way. But if you were to ask me today, 
I would tell you that I would not trade that diagnosis. I would not trade that season of severe trial for anything in the world. It was invaluable to me. Early on in the treatment, I picked up a book by a man named Donald Whitney entitled Disciplines for the Christian Life, and it changed my life. If you haven't read it, you should go get it. It will change your life as well. I picked up that book, and I read a chapter in that book about the gift of Scripture memory. And I sensed from the Lord that because of the trial and because of the time that I was going to have going through trial, that it would be wise to take time to learn the skill of Scripture memory. I had tried many times before, not been successful at it, but I felt the Lord saying, try again. And so I gave myself to the book of James. So I figured I'd start in a small book rather than a big book. And I can't tell you how rewarding James was to me then and how rewarding James has remained. I regularly hear in my head the voice of James. Joel, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. I regularly hear in my head the voice of James. Joel, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Be careful, Joel, be careful. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. God met me in powerful ways through the book of James. James is so practical, so helpful for the believer's life as God calls us to go on to maturity. I love the book of James. I'm excited about being in it with all of you this morning. This morning, we're going to talk about trials and suffering. If you're a guest with us, happy Sunday. <laughs> trials and suffering. These things are never easy to talk about, but they are important to talk about because they exist in all of our lives. And James does an exceptional job of helping us to know how to deal with them in the way that God intends for us to deal with them. We need this, don't we? So I want to spend time looking at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Let's read that briefly. I'll pray, and then we'll begin. This is the word of God. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lord, would you send your spirit into this place? Teach us your word. Show us your grace. Display Christ to us this morning so that we might know you more and seek to live for your glory in greater ways through every season and difficult situation of our lives. Amen. Amen. When we, when we deal with the topics of trials and sufferings, isn't it true that there are, there are stereotypical ways that Christians in the church often deal with sufferings, and oftentimes there are ways that we want to avoid? I don't know if you're familiar with them, but there's a, there's a series of videos on the internet by a group of guys called Dude Perfect. And these guys are, they, they, they excel at humor and they create these videos of different stereotypes in life. And so they have a, they have a video of, of stereotypical guys at the gym. And so they have the guy who spends more time looking in the mirror than he does actually working out. They talk about the guy who, who screams as if he's giving birth to a cow while he's lifting weights. They have a video of, of stereotypical players in a pickup basketball game. And they talk about the guy who makes excuses for everything that he does. Sorry, sorry, my bad, my bad. They talk about the football basketball player, the guy who, who plows his way through the lane, fouling everybody, and then claims that he was fouled on the way up. I imagine that this is Aaron on the basketball court, if I was to be honest with you. Sadly, though, Sadly, when I watch those videos, I can easily imagine these guys creating a video for stereotypical ways that Christians deal with suffering within the church. Unhelpful ways. You know, you could have the, you could have the 828 guy, right? 
The guy who no matter what you're going through, no matter what trial you're enduring, he always cites Romans 8, 28, which is a glorious verse, but he's got nothing else to offer you in that moment but Romans 8, 28. You have, the, you have the furrowed brow and low whisper guy. When you begin to speak of trial, he like morphs into a different person, starts rubbing your back, and you're just like, I just need a little space. Thank you. You could have the it's okay guy. who No matter what you tell him, he says, it's okay, trust God but I just got diagnosed with Ebola. It's okay, trust God. Or you have the I know how you feel guy. So you're in community group and you're talking about how later that week you have open heart surgery scheduled and you're you're struggling with anxiety and this guy's like, it's okay. I know how you feel. I had a wart removed last year. It was really hard on me. God's going to be with you. Church, we can have some very unhelpful ways of caring for one another. Not not all of them are bad all the time, but oftentimes they are unhelpful. One of the things that I love about the book of James is that James gives us an excellent example to follow in this. James helps us to know how to deal with suffering in our own lives and how to care for others within the body of Christ who are suffering. So I want, us, I want us to learn from James today. If we, if we were to ask James, James, how can we best prepare ourselves for suffering and how can we best help others to deal with their suffering, what would he say? What would James tell us? Well, I believe that after James took time to relate to us in our suffering, to weep as we feel sorrow in our suffering, not in a contrived sort of way, but in the same way that his brother Jesus did when his friend Lazarus died. James would take time to weep with those who weep, to feel sorrow with those who are sorrowful. But after spending time there, I believe that James would have three or four things that he would call us to as the church as well. Three or four things from these verses that can help us to think through our trials, the areas of suffering in our lives. We just want to consider them one by one today. First, James, James would call us to see the community of suffering to which we belong. That's the first thing he would call us to. He would say, see the community of suffering to which you belong. We can see this in several ways. We see it first in the setting that he is writing into. Verse 1, he addresses it, his whole letter, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. James is writing to the people who were once members of his own local church in Jerusalem. These are friends. This is family who lived life with him, but who have now been persecuted, who have now been dispersed and scattered throughout the world. I love how James does not write individual letters to individual members of his church. No, he writes and copies one letter and sends it to all of them. He's writing to a group of people who are not suffering alone, but who are suffering together. Together they have lost homes. Together they have lost their jobs. Together they have lost loved ones. Together they have lost what is normal and comfortable. And James is very intentional to show them that they've not lost these things in isolation, but rather together. We can also see it in how he addresses them in verse 2 when he says, Count it all joy, I love this, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. James calls them brothers or and sisters 17 times in these five short chapters. Why? Why does he do that? Because he wants to remind us of our familial relationship in the gospel. We are members of the body of Christ together. James is taking the reality of suffering and he's placing it at the center of who we are as the people of God. James chapter 5, at the the end of the letter, when he returns to the topic of suffering again, he places suffering at the center of the church. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. 
and pray for one another that you may be healed. James chapter 5, verse 10, he tells us to follow the example of many who have gone before us and who have suffered, even men like Job. Throughout the entire letter, James talks about suffering and he talks about it to the whole church and not to individuals. We can, we can even see it in how he doesn't speak to any specific type of suffering, but how he says in verse 2, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Church, that word various is a wonderfully inclusive word, isn't it? James is inviting all of his readers to identify themselves in what he's saying. He's, he's not just talking to a few over here with this kind of trial, but not to those over here with this other kind of trial. He's not even talking to those who may not be or seem to be in trial right now. Notice that he doesn't say, count it all joy if you meet various trials, but count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. This is so important for us. Because I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to isolate myself in my suffering. Do you know what I mean by that? I often either isolate myself in my suffering by seeing my trials as far worse than anybody else's or as not nearly as bad as anybody else's. And both are unhelpful. Do you do that? When something bad happens to me, I either say, man, no one's suffering like I am. Nobody else has a head cold. This is hard. Nobody has the family that I have. Nobody has the coworkers that I have to deal with. Nobody has the children going through what they're going through like I do. Sure, they get sick, but not, not as sick as I get sick. So we either isolate ourselves in our suffering by seeing ourselves as worse than anybody else, or we minimize our suffering and say that compared to others, it's really not that big of a deal. It's not suffering. Sure, I have strep throat, but at least I don't have cancer. And there's something good about that, right? There's something good that, that, that repositions our heart in that and gives us perspective on our trials. But if we're not careful, if we minimize our trials, to, we can minimize them to the point of not seeing them as, as trials at all and thereby unhelpfully recuse ourselves from the grace of God that is available to us even in the small things. But what James does here is so helpful. He refuses to, to parse out the different kinds of suffering. He refuses to talk to these and not those. He refuses to talk just about the really big stuff but not the small stuff. No, his counsel is to those who meet trials of various kinds. Cancer diagnosis. God is there for you. Loss of job. God has a purpose in it. Broken water heater in your home. God is ready to surprise you with grace. Flat tire on the way to work. God's in it somewhere. Children who are going astray and bringing grief. God is working it together for good. Inability to have children. God is in it. Research papers accidentally deleted. God wants to give you hope. Unwanted singleness. God wants to meet you. Unable to sleep. God wants to be your rest. It's, it's good. James is caring for us as the body of Christ. It's good to see all these things, no matter how big or small, as the various trials that God wants to help us through. He wants us to walk with him daily in all things. And if you're a Christian man or woman, then you are part of the community of men and women who are called by God not to endure alone, but to endure together. Amen? And not only, not only are we called to endure together, but we have a Savior who has endured with us. God's word makes it clear that Jesus was not a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sins. He knows the pain. Not just the big pain, but the small pain as well. 
James wants us to see ourselves as part of the brotherhood and the sisterhood of God's family who, who are, listen, as he says, exiles in the world, but who are enduring together. We are the people who are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We are beaten down, but not crushed. We aren't surprised when fiery trials come upon us as though something strange were happening to us. And friends, as depressing as it may sound, there's comfort in this. Trials are coming, but we have each other and we have Christ. You know, application for us in this, beyond just the comfort of knowing that we're not alone, how important is the church? How important is community together? As you grow together, redemption hell, how important is it to not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some? How important to, to attend community group? The last thing the Christian man or woman wants is to find themselves in trial without community around them. And so how valuable, how important to prioritize community and community group and service towards one another, even when we feel as if trials are not yet upon us. It will strengthen us in the days to come, and it will strengthen those around us. James says to us first, see the community of suffering to which you belong. The second call of James to us is to see the spiritual value of our suffering. See the spiritual value, the spiritual worth of your suffering. In verses two through three, it says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. In James' mind, these two things are equal. Trials equal a testing of our faith. They are one and the same. Trials are not just a physical burden in this world, but they have an eternal, eternal spiritual value as well. They are a testing of our faith. Now we have to ask, what, what does he mean by this testing? What kind of, of testing is this? And this is an important. It's important to see, lest we have a wrong view of God and a wrong view of our circumstances, that for James, church, this is not a, a testing that is a type of, of midterm or, or final exam. This is not a, a pass or fail kind of testing of our faith. Let's be honest. It'd be hard to count it all joy if we had a perpetual midterm in front of us. If our salvation was determined and tested by whether how we handled a good day or a bad day. Now sometimes the trials in a person's life can lead them to see that they are not accepted by God. Through suffering, an unbeliever or a non-Christian can find that they have no strength, no wisdom on their own, and that they desperately need the wisdom and the strength of God. They need to run to Jesus to be saved. So perhaps for the non-Christian, trials can test them in that way to some degree. But for the Christian, trials and suffering is not a test of our salvation. No, no, we know that God accepts us based on what? On our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. He endured the worst suffering so that we would not have to. He is life and salvation to us. So this testing that, that James is speaking of, it's not, it's not pass or fail in that sense, but rather it is more like a, a helpful and a skillful training, a, a strengthening that happens in our lives, in our souls. If you have the ESV study Bible, it says that this testing is a positive test meant to bring about good in us. It's a positive test meant to bring about good in us. I heard one pastor say that God is not interested in weak and feeble faith among his people, and so he takes us through the waters. That's true. That's true. 
James chapter 4 verse 5 says that God yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. God wants his spirit within you to cause your faith in him to grow stronger and stronger by the day, even as you feel your weakness mount up as you endure. So for the Christian, trials are a test of our faith that is, that is more like a, a painful, it's painful, but it's a wonderful training ground through which our spirit and our faith is made strong. Listen, exercise hurts, right? Exercise is not always pleasant. It's difficult. It can be hard, but it's benefiting us in a really significant way. If you go to the gym and you get on the treadmill and you aim to, to run for 30 minutes, that's great. If you get off at 20 minutes, you're not going to die. You're not going to fall over dead. You didn't fail any test, but you are going to be less healthy than if you stayed on for the full 30 minutes. There's a benefit to staying on the treadmill. And there's a benefit in God's word and in his wisdom to, to staying in the trial, to enduring through the trial. He is refining us. And so we run the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, because in the midst of the race, Jesus is showing himself in greater and greater ways and causing us to display his glory in greater and greater ways. As we run through this life with our eyes set on him, our faith is strengthened and our witness is brightened in this world. This is, the, this is the spiritual value of our trials. James says that our trials produce steadfastness in us. Do you know what steadfastness means? Biblically speaking, it means to endure, to, to continue on under the weight of something heavy. That's what steadfastness is. But, but the enduring is not the end in itself. It's not the goal. The goal is that we might be strengthened and ultimately changed, that we might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Athletes do this all the time. The baseball player warms up with a weight on the end of his bat, not because he's going to go to the plate with that bat, but because he wants to, to train and prepare himself to swing faster. The swimmer swims with extra drag. The weight or the drag are not the end in themselves, but rather a way to strengthen them to perform better. God does not want us to endure trials just because he wants us to suffer, friends. No, he uses trials and suffering in this fallen world as a training ground to strengthen and equip his people to know and love him more and to live fuller and happier lives for him. And you know what? Redemption Hill, it's, it's working. It's working in you. As much as it hurts, as much as you want to get out of it, God is doing this in your life. He's doing this in your home. He's doing this in your church right now. Be comforted today. God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is skillfully refining you for his glory. He's not burning you. He is skillfully taking away the dross. If you let him do this work, you will realize that your relationship with Jesus is actually never as sweet, it's never as deep as when you are walking through those hard times. He teaches you more. He comforts you more. He opens his word to you more. You experience him in ways that you never would have apart from that trial. I remember when I had cancer. 12 years ago, and I was, I was in the worst part of the treatment, the, the most severe part. Oh, man, I was a mess. I had so much pain. Every morning I would wake up and, and just not want to get out of bed. My throat was filled with these, these long, white lacerations that went down that made it almost impossible even to breathe, let alone talk or swallow. I was taking medicines to stir up my bone marrow to help my blood and so every bone in my body hurt every finger even my skull ached everything hurt I laid in bed and I had a tube going into my throat poisoning my body with with chemotherapy in order to make me well it was unbelievable 
But I came across this verse early on, and it was life to my soul. Early mornings, late nights, dark hospital rooms all alone. I'd be curled up in pain, and I would just say to myself over and over, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I felt like, a, like, a, like an Olympic runner running a marathon. I didn't look like one, believe me. I looked horrible. But I felt like one running that race. It's for the gold. It's for the gold. It's for the gold. Friends, you, wherever you are right now, whatever unimaginable trial you are walking through, whatever issue that you never thought would be a part of your life, God is refining you, and there is a great reward waiting for you. Verse 12 says, there is a crown of life waiting for those who remain steadfast. There's a glorious reward for those who know and love Jesus through every season in every difficult circumstance of this life. James wants us to see the spiritual worth, the spiritual value of our suffering. Though painful, though difficult, though severe, the Spirit of God is using your trials to refine you today. He's taking away the pride. He's taking away the self-sufficiency. He's taking away every sin that keeps you from looking more like Christ. He's reminding you that you are weak, but he is strong. Can we just agree that to have the king of grace doing this skillful work in our life, what, what a privilege to be not left in our sin, but to be changed by him day by day. What a joy. And that brings us to our, our final point. James, James has called us to, to see the community of suffering to which we belong, to see the spiritual worth or value of our suffering. I would have a point in here about prayer and the need to ask God for wisdom in our suffering because it's right in verse 5, but we don't have time for that today. Pray. Make prayer essential, an essential part of your suffering. Final for today, James calls us to seek to find joy in our suffering. There are very stereotypical ways that Christians can relate to suffering. Again, not all of them bad all the time, but, but they are bad when it's, it's the only way that we deal with suffering. Catch phrases that we throw around. James helps us to find the balance in this, and perhaps one of the most striking things and distinct ways that James instructs us to deal with suffering is that, he, is that he tells us to count it all joy. Count it all joy. What in the world is he talking about? Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Listen, I think that we are familiar as a church and as a family of churches with the glorious truth that God is sovereign over our suffering, right? He's able to use them for our good. That's not a new idea to us. We know those truths. Matthew chapter 5 is familiar. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad, he says. Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good. 1 Peter 1 verse 6, in this you rejoice. God is refining you. So the idea that our trials can be used by God for our good, it's not new to us. It's not new to our family of churches. But what is James specifically saying to us here? Well, the significance of what he is saying can be found in the word count. He says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. That word count, it means to have the conscious thought about. 
Have the, have the conscious thought. Have the intentional thought of joy. Set your mind on joy. That word can actually mean to, to govern or to make a judgment about. So James is pastoring us here and he is saying, govern your own hearts in the midst of suffering. Don't let them run away from you. Have the intentional thought of joy. And this is so important because as though we know Romans 8, 28, we know it to be true. Can't we forget it so easily? James, as a pastor to his people and to us, he's comforting them. He's exhorting us to not forget. And not just to not forget, but to seek to make what they know about God to be true in their hearts and a joy and a pleasure to their souls. James is saying, James is encouraging us to, to govern our own hearts in the midst of trials, to, to speak truth to ourselves and to call ourselves to delight in the wonderful theological truth that God is active in a broken world. I have one son who is a pretty forgetful young man and he, his mind is so active on other things that when we ask him to do something, it's, it's, it's often that it just slips out of his mind very quickly. Son, can you go upstairs and get this and bring it to daddy? Sure, dad. Walks out of the room, walks back. What did you say? Son, what did, what did I tell you to do? And he stands there. Oftentimes he's like, think, think, think. What, what did he say? Think, think, think. And it's funny. And he's growing in it. But I think that's a picture of how we're supposed to act as Christians in the midst of our suffering because we so easily forget. We're the only ones suffering. God's not in control. God doesn't have power over these circumstances. No, church. Think, think, think. He is good and he does good. He is sovereign over all things. Friends, we need to count it all joy. We need to reckon God's truth to our souls and to our situations. And when we do that, we begin to see our trials. Not as mountains that we have to overcome, not as suffering that we are to avoid, but as part of the miraculous and glorious good work that God has for us until we get to see him face to face. James is a wonderfully practical book. James is about taking Christians on to maturity. He wants us to be strong, and he gives us a lot of practical ways to do that. Not showing partiality, being generous, being kind, guarding our words. And in such a practical book, I've often asked the question, why does he start with suffering? Why does he end with suffering? Why? He's taking us on to maturity. Why does he deal with suffering in such an intentional way? Here's, here's what I believe. I believe that James knows that oftentimes people can forget the goodness of God in our sufferings and use suffering as an excuse away from maturity in Christ. This is my experience. When I have a hard day, when I'm suffering, when things haven't gone my way, I excuse myself when I'm impatient with my son or my daughter. I get more angry and I, and I tell myself, that's okay. I often watch more TV. I get lazy. I don't center my mind on the things that I should be centering on. Why? Because I feel like, well, this has been tough. This is hard. I have reason to, to enjoy these things, to, to be lazy in the pursuit of Christ. It's not always bad to do those things. But friends, so often we can miss so much of the maturity, the joy that God has for us by not seeing the difficulty in the moment as part of his work. So James starts with suffering and he ends on suffering in a book all about maturity. How good to hear that even the worst moments of our lives, they're not interruptions to our journey towards Christ. They're part of it. He is taking us to glory. And part of that journey is walking through the difficulties that he is skillfully using for our good, for our family's good, and for our church's good. So that every day that we suffer, every day that we deal with sorrow and pain, it's actually a reminder that God is on the move among us, sanctifying us, changing us, making us more and more like we'll be on that final day when we see him face to face. In church, that means that we can count it all joy because he is good and he does good. Let me pray for us. 
Father, I am not a member here, so I don't know all of the trials that brothers and sisters are experiencing right now, but I know that you do. You don't, you're not just vaguely aware. You know them by name, and you know the circumstances in detail. And so, Spirit of God, I ask you to come and bring comfort. Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Father, would you comfort your people today by showing them your gracious hand that is at work in their circumstances. If there were men or women who came in today feeling as if they could not go on, Lord, set their eyes on the risen Christ and give them the strength to endure until that final day. And not just to endure begrudgingly. Lord, do the miraculous work of helping us all to endure with joy because we have a Savior who is, at, who is close at hand. Jesus, thank you for being a high priest that can relate to us. We pray all these things in your name and for your glory and for our good. Amen.